Show you how. I'm Scott Newell. We'll also meet syndicated columnist Miss Manners. Be there at 9. Family Feud will not be seen tonight, so that we may bring you this Channel 3 special, 35 Great Years. 35 Great Years is brought to you in part by True... Welcome, neighbors. Sing, Fido. Left off. Here is George South. Help me to the Beatles. See you then. Thank you. Here are the NBC people. Good evening. I'm Judd Hambrick. It was 35 years ago tonight that NBC television first opened its bag of tricks in Cleveland. It was Halloween, 1948. We were on Channel 4 then. Our call letters were WNBK. And it was a very different world. Two days later, Harry Truman was elected president. The Indians had just won their last World Series. The Browns were in the middle of an undefeated season in the old All-American Conference. And television sets were neighborhood curiosities, about as common as backyard satellite dishes are today. This was the first picture NBC broadcast in Cleveland. It could hardly have inspired visions of the impact television would come to have on our culture. I think we started at 6 in the evening, and then we ran to maybe 10 or 11. News was the last to uh, 1 in the afternoon. You'd find shows back to back, live shows back to back, a cooking show and then ham and eggs, which I did 11 o'clock talk show, then a singing show, and, you know, you'd run from one studio to the other. Jay Miltner was working for NBC in Cleveland before that first WNBK test pattern went over the air. The moon was all aglow and heaven was in your eyes. That night that you told me those little white lies. He got his start here as a radio crooner back when we had a radio station called WTAM and performers wore tuxedos. The face may no longer be familiar, but the voice still is. This is WKYC TV3 in Cleveland. There is one other pre-television man still at work around here, Tom Haley. I did a show called Haley's Daily, and it was an hour show with sketches and everything else in it every day. And I had to come up with that entire show. I had to make up the funnies, make up the sketches, do the interviews and stuff like that. That was the first show, and I used to wake up in the middle of the night sometimes having nightmares because I couldn't think of what am I going to do tomorrow. TV may not exactly have come of age in the 1950s, but it certainly began to make its mark. It's not supposed to be like the 50s. Except for a few films, all programming was broadcast live, and everything was so new that just about every show had an air of spontaneity and experiment about it. For the first time, we got a chance to see serious drama performed right in our own living rooms by those who were already stars. I'd rather be hungry and be an actress than anything else in the world. And those who would be. Oh, this is my suitcase. Your suitcase? Sure, I keep all my things in here. So ladies and germs, ladies and gentlemen. And TV personalities started to become as familiar as some of our relatives. People like Uncle Milton, Milton Burrow. <laughs> Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis. Thing. Sid Caesar and Imogene Coker. <laughs> it was the time when advertisers didn't just buy commercial time, they financed whole shows. So on WNBK, we had the Cadillac News with Tom Fields, the Big Boy Sports with Joe Mulvihill, and the Atlantic Weather with Joe Finan. In case you don't remember or you weren't yet around to watch, those newscasts were more than mildly different from what we're used to today. Former news director, Sanford Markey. I recall at one period of time, we only had five minutes of the evening news, and that embraced sports and weather. In 1954, WNBK put up the most powerful television antenna in the Midwest, and more people in the outlying areas got a chance to watch the Indians the last time they were in a World Series but they were watching it on channel three. Our signal had become so strong, we had to change channels to avoid interfering with the broadcast from those other guys down the street. 
The next year, Westinghouse traded its Philadelphia radio and television stations for NBC's Cleveland stations, and WNBK and WTAM became KYW. And as we say in the trade, don't go away, we'll have more right after this. Local television exploded in the second half of the 1950s. Virtually every home came to have a TV set and local personalities came to have as big an impact as the network stars. In 1957, KYW began producing what would quickly become the highest rated local show ever done in Cleveland, Barnaby. Welcome neighbors, Merry Christmas. Barnaby was and is a fellow named Lynn Sheldon. And the amazing thing about his show is that it was virtually all ad-libbed, made up on the spot. Like the day he walked into the station and found several barrels of ping pong balls left behind after a commercial was filmed and decided to challenge the best ping pong players in the world to a match. In Japan, you call up very bad. Get the hell he don't send away the best one. We went through all the countries and kids liked the dialect and it gave more credence to the fact that they were coming from all over the world. So at the end of the program, I said, gentlemen, and they had the camera right up to almost to the net of the ping pong table. I said, there isn't time to play you individually, so I'll play you all at once. It's your serve. And all the stagehands and everybody around, they had baskets, buckets full of ping pong balls. I said, serve. And for the last five minutes, that screen was just filled with flying ping pong balls. Barnaby's beginning had the same improvisational flair. When KYW decided to put on a cartoon show, management couldn't find a host it liked. So Sheldon was hired to fill in until someone better came along. He resurrected the character of the leprechaun he had played in a stage production of Finian's Rainbow and added a dash of Buster Keaton for variety. As the premiere show's theme music was rolling, he was missing only one thing. And I turned to Billy Yaner, who's still a stagehand here, and uh, I said, I don't have a name. He said, my dog's name is Barnaby. And I said, that's good enough for a few weeks. I opened the door and said, hello, my name is Barnaby. Barnaby became so popular, he was on the air live seven days a week. Lynn Sheldon became the highest paid television personality in town and the show made enough money to finance location filming in Arizona, at the Seattle World's Fair, even a recreation of the first Thanksgiving at Plymouth, Massachusetts. What do you think the children are saying? I want the white meat. I want a drumstick. I'm hungry too now. Barnaby also acquired a sidekick along the way, Woodrow the Woodsman, played by Clay Conroy. What is this? One of the first KYW personalities to make a mark here is still doing for Miami what he once did for Cleveland, hosting the station movie while playing the piano and making off-the-wall remarks. Now that movie number one! Big Wilson hosted the afternoon movie at KYW from 1956 to 1961. But his, pardon the expression, biggest notoriety in town came from his morning radio show with his cohort, Fido the Canary. Fido the Canary is jumping in his cage here. I think we can catch an actual uh, on-the-air jump. Here, wait a minute. Back and forth from perch to perch. That's funny. He hasn't been doing that for a long time. Sing, Fido. Say something, Fido. It was a happy sound. I played piano, and he'd start to... <whistles> whatever canaries do, he did it. Or she. Never did find out. <laughs> Didn't care. And news became a more important part of KYW programming as the years went on. At first, any announcer on the staff could and would do the news. But in 1957, Paul Sharia was hired just to be a street reporter, the station's first pure newsman. My name is Pete French, representing the KYW TV newsroom for this, our exposure of gambling in Northern Ohio in 1957. Sharia's contacts led to some exposés and to some other stories that weren't crime related. The police helped him get an exclusive interview, for instance, with Vice President Nixon when he came to town for a news conference. Sure. 